Rishi, you talk about you've looked at you know, up to 100 deals, you've invested in six. Can each of you guys give an idea for, for the guys out there? When you look at a business, when you speak to an entrepreneur, when you think about either doing an investment or about working with that company, what are the, the, the key things you are looking for? What, what makes one of those businesses stand out and makes you think, yes, we're going to invest? So, Rishi, do you want to continue yeah, from that? That's a great question. Um, you know, that's really the secret sauce of our investment philosophy and, and thesis. Um, when I meet the CEO of a company who asks for financing for a new business, um, one of the first things I ask him is, what market are you going after uh, and who is your cohort? Um, and that often means, um, what is the exact demographic that you're hoping to enlist as a user of your technology? And it could be, um, it could be artists, uh, it could be um, you know, millennials generally from 18 to 34, it could be something focused that's much more specific, you know, producers of music. Um, there's um, you know, a number of different ways to, sli uh, to slice up a, a demographic uh, and, and have some traction um, with your product or service. So once we have an understanding that they're focused on a certain cohort, then we try to see what sort of, um, what sort of traction they've gotten with their business. Um, in terms of key metrics, and one of the metrics that people often look at is monthly active users. If you're looking at something in the context of a web platform, or if it's something that's more of a consumer electronics or hardware device, number of units sold, uh, and then dive into some of the financial economics behind you know, cost per unit production. Um, and so once we've decided in, in, uh, that there's certain spaces interesting, we'll dive a little bit further to see what the competitive landscape is like. We've looked at a lot of businesses, for example, in streaming. And streaming is a, is a bit of a scary place for us right now because there's just so many businesses doing streaming, whether it's be at TV or live stream or Ustream or TuneMelt, or, and the list goes on and on. We've probably met about 10 different streaming businesses that I know of, and there's probably another 10, 20 or 30 out there. Who knows? Um, but there's so many people doing streaming right now, and it's hard to differentiate because um, at the end of the day, if you're a technology platform, you want to differentiate yourself in technology, but it's, from a streaming perspective, it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge because the technology um, is basically a matter of getting a camera crew to do some filming and then having an infrastructure that allows you to serve that content to, uh, to your particular market. Uh, so there's nothing quite differentiated there. So it's something that we've kind of stayed on the, on the sidelines of um, some of the areas that have been very interesting for us. Um, have been um, things that are very unique in their application of technology. Um, one of the businesses that we invested in um, was initially geared towards producers. Uh, it's a business called Lander Audio. You may or may not have heard of it, um, but they do. Um, they have an artificial intelligence-based technology that um, allows you to master music without any human interaction, uh, which is actually quite breathtaking. And for you audio engineers out there, you might you might say, wait a minute, you know, how do you do that? Um, how do you replace an audio engineer? Well, the intent was never to replace the audio engineer, but give that bedroom DJ an actual chance to make their music sound as good as possible and actually have a chance for them to actually sign with a label. Um, but the long-term vision of this business is really what drives our motivation to be investors in it, is taking that technology and being able to take any stream of music, whether it's um, music in, from Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, or another source, could be radio, and mastering it on the fly. And that's pretty powerful, uh, especially if you think about all the content that's streamed from a video perspective. You know, if Beyonce is doing 10 dates across the United States and streaming all of her shows, wouldn't she want her music in connection with her video to sound as good as possible? Wouldn't she want it mastered before it hits the ears of consumers? Probably. So some of the things that we look at um, you know, are very much technology differentiation, the market that you're attacking, and then how much traction you got. And then all of this has to be underpinned by the most fundamental thing that we look at is, can the CEO execute on this? Um, and you know, all too often, the CEO, the management team is um, lacking. And uh, it could be a great technology, but you know, if the CEO can't execute on it, you know, it's probably not a worthwhile investment. And to you, Greg, and I guess you know you mentioned already that, that maybe your, your sort of 
strong aggression and, and kind of uh, acquisition phase is, is now maybe coming to a close and you're more of an operating company. Can you give maybe people a bit of a flavor to what you look for maybe as a partnership or one of those tactical investments? Um, and, and just I think going back to your original question, I would add, um, I agree with everything that you said about the cohort group and the traction and uh, prototype of a model. You know, it's what you're looking at. I have another filter that I tend to look at, which is um, does this business solve a problem? Too many times, those of us who make investments, whether we're inside of a big company or we're in, a, in a, an investment vehicle, we're funding ideas. And the challenge with ideas is they're just that, they're concepts, they're ideas. And, and if, if I apply any other filter that, to what was said earlier, it would be, is this solving a problem for my business or is it a solving a problem for the ultimate consumer of whatever this company is doing? So I have found that if I put that rigor against things, it's a really, it's a really strong filter. Um, and you don't get caught up in the hype and, and, and believing um, that things are just going to will themselves to, to be a good investment. Um, when it comes to the kind of, of partnerships that we're looking at now, I, I think so much of what I, what I talked about this morning and what we're doing at the company um, is around digital. So there are, you can imagine a lot of enhancements, whether it's things that we might do in streaming, things we might do in social. I, I'm particularly interested now in what's going to make discovery of music better. Um, I was in Nashville last week at a, at a music panel, and the whole topic was about how do, we, how do we help new artists, how do we help the fan discover, and, and the concept was beyond the algorithm. Algorithms have gotten interesting, they've gotten good, they see what you play and what you listen to, but we all have a device on us all the time, we're moving about, we're going places, there's all kinds of inputs that you can take in, and there's a lot of interesting technologies that are happening around the area of cutting through the clutter for the fan based on fans' behavior or established preferences. And I want to I wanna improve and jump forward what other streaming services have done and see if there's a way we can be more intelligent from a technology standpoint. Some of these things are also about really geo-based and events you've attended. But I also want to be clear, and it's important in, in this type of community, just because we're about the music that we're about and the culture we're about doesn't mean our fans don't listen to other types of music and doesn't mean they don't go to the movies and doesn't mean they don't watch television. I want to take all of that entertainment and figure out ways to get smarter about how we educate the fan that this is a new artist because you've done these other things or expressed interest. So it's, it's that kind of tech on the digital side. And then on the, on the live side of our business, right, we operate these amazing festival experiences, especially on the multi-day. Um, they are investments in companies or partnerships with companies that are going to just do one thing, which is enhance the fan experience over the course of those couple of days. And that may be similar to this band is playing on this stage or this artist is playing on this stage or whatever it might be, um, and you should go check them out because we know these things about you. Or the band that you're wearing that is your currency for the weekend at Mysteryland or at Tomorrowland can also let you, because you just met someone, do that and now you've exchanged information on your Beatport account and you now um, are following each other in, in, a, in your social media. So. Really, on the, on the live side, it's fan enhancement, and there's a lot to that. Um, there's everything from virtual reality plays that are happening um, to you know, RFIDs and things we're doing with our big partners like MasterCard and things on the ticketing. And on the digital side, it it's, uh, it's tends to be around streaming and enhancement of discovery for, for music. Yeah, Greg, just a quick comment here. I totally agree with you on, on that point, and uh, I think music consumers today are dealing with what, what I would characterize as a paralysis of choice. There's just too much music out there, and music listeners just don't even know where to start. So this has actually been an up-and-coming area for a lot of music tech startups, and being able to take various parameters that are more human in nature and less algorithmic to help sift through all the music that's available out there to find the appropriate match between the consumer's taste and, uh, and what the artist has to showcase and share with the world. So totally agree with your comment on that. And Rishi, are you able to build on that by giving us an example of, of anyone that is in the space that's currently doing yeah, that kind example, of thing? Yeah, for example, there's a business called 8Tracks run by Dave Porter uh, based out of San Francisco. And if you know anything about 8Tracks, uh, they have um, this platform where you can go and you can um, indicate your interests in a certain type of music, to say jazz, reggae, hip hop, R&B, and then also um, indicate parameters related to how you're feeling, so your emotion, whether you're in a happy, sad, depressed sort of mood. And it takes into, these, into consideration also your profile settings, and then it comes up with curated playlists based off of that that fit those exact parameters. So a very interesting way to 
um, discover music based off of how you're feeling, but also your particular genre of taste and, and, and preferences. Cool. And Rick, is there any other companies that you'd highlight at the moment or areas of the industry which you think are really interesting and that you guys are, are currently looking at or interested in getting involved in? Without giving away any names. Yeah, well, it's hard, hard for me to answer that question. Uh, you know, I, I, th I think that we continue to look uh, for the people behind successful companies. And I think as to Greg's point, you know, uh, there is a strategic plan. There are a number of companies within our ecosystem. And so I think we're always focused on how can this acquisition assist us to accomplish a broader a goal in our strategic plan or complement another business and or interoperate with another company within our group and benefit both the acquisition and the other members of the group. So it's uh, hard for me to name specific names, but that's very much our criteria. Great. And uh, Greg, do you have anything to add before yeah, we throw it open? And the obvious ones are growth, um, helping a company that's moving along at a good clip. Maybe they're cash flow positive, maybe they're not, but they join a larger organization. They get shared services, shared resources. We like to say that we try and support our, our companies from the center versus mandate from the top, so maintain the, opera the operating philosophies that they have, but make sure that they're getting the benefits of being part of a global group. Um, the second one um, is skill sets, right? You can be an entrepreneur and you're very focused on a certain problem that you're solving, and, but you're, you're doing everything you can to grow that business, but you've never had exposure to other parts of the business ecosystem, whether it's fundraising, public equity markets, marketing, um, digital, right? You could buy a, a company that's very focused in the live business, but has never been exposed to digital marketing or digital technologies. So you have the opportunity to come in and be part of something and learn more. And then I think one that none of us have talked about, but it's a little more unique to an operating company than it is to investors, is a lifeline. Right? There are, you, know, you can't forget that there are, there are great ideas, small companies who are solving a great problem, but just haven't gotten it done. And we can throw them a lifeline and bring them in, and it's almost an aqua hire. And we can, we can either employ them and fund that going forward inside of our company, um, or more often than not, we can scatter their great skills across the company, work on other things, but they can still work passionately in the, uh, in the industry that they love. Their thing just didn't work out. Great. Right, well, guys, we've got just under 10 minutes left, so we'll throw it open for questions uh, and maybe even some pitches, I don't know. So we've got some microphones. Has anyone got any questions? There's one at the back. Hi, guys. Um, John Trulove, Trulove Music Publishing. Um, I've got a question about something that's preoccupying us um, from a rights holder perspective. Um, it's a, it's a little company you may have heard of um, that is a bit of a thorn in our side, SoundCloud. Now, that's completely supported by uh, BC at the moment. Um, from your point of view, um, how would each of you view that from an investment perspective? Would you? <laughs> Good question. Who wants to uh, start? Sound, SoundCloud. What, are you asking would I invest in SoundCloud? Yep. Uh, the answer is no, I would not. Um, I think, albeit they have 350 million monthly active users, um, this whole issue of rights management, as John, my partner, likes to call it, is a, is a Gordian knot. And right now it's fraught with liabilities. Um, they really haven't done um, an adequate job, I think, of assessing um, the payments uh, that are entitled to artists that are played out on their platform. Um, so while I would not invest in SoundCloud, we have been extensively looking at music technology businesses that provide royalty and licensing solutions. Um, and this is a very interesting space uh, of which there are, I think, one of multiple <coughs> outcomes. Um, and as someone who's in a publishing business, this may or may not be of interest to you, but um, you know, there's some camps that take the approach that um, that a solution will develop something like that of Bitcoin, um, and that is a, a very decentralized database that's kept with all the rights holders' information and royalty splits, uh, and as such, that database is accessed um, by um, PROs and other organizations to ensure that royalties are paid. And 
the, the issue with that I have is that's kind of wishful thinking because unless someone is financially incentive to maintain such a database, I don't really see it happening. Um, another camp um, that we've seen, and this is really how things are starting to pan out in the market today, having talked to probably five or ten different businesses that are trying to provide um, royalty uh, and licensing management solutions, um, is that they're all taking it with the approach of capturing fiefdoms, if you will, you know, and it's um, YouTube users or DJs or rock and roll um, musicians or um, you know, anything of that like. Uh, and so really where this would go um, is multiple solutions um, in a very fragmented market. Each business or solution out there that has um, real, um, real capabilities serving certain markets but not other markets. So at the end of the day, I don't think that really provides an adequate solution because it, you know, today we have multiple PROs that don't talk to each other, multiple publishing companies that don't talk to each other. So it remains as fragmented um, under this potential solution as it, as it was. So what is the real fix? Well, if you really want to ask my opinion, um, my opinion of how this can be adequately solved um, you know, is, almost analogy, analogous to um, financial markets data. Um, so for example, if you look at um, derivative securities um, for foreign currency, equities, fixed income, there was up until the, the, the 90s, there was no standard database for pricing of futures and forwards contracts or option contracts. And, and I know this you know, as an extra Wall Street guy. But the way they solved this problem and were able to actually create an accurate pricing for call it you know, gold futures, is they set up a new entity where all the invested um, institutions that are huge brokers for these products invested in this new entity, and they standardized the data. And so there was a, there was a corporation that was owned by multiple people that standardized the data, and when that business got big enough, they monetized that business through an IPO. And so at that point, all the vested parties are invested equally into this business and have um, th the same financial incentive to support the standardized data. And it's up to you whether or not you sell the stock or you sell your stake or you don't want any part of it. But at the end of the day, that was a very um, free markets, capitalistic way to provide an elegant solution to um, financial data. And trust me, financial data is even more complicated than rights management. Um, and what it used to be was supply and demand um, dictating pricing for certain brokerages for you know, futures contracts, but a different price with a different brokerage. And that was a mess, because nobody really knew the real price of certain contracts. So there is a potential solution, but it's going to take one thing uh, more than anything, and that's industry cooperation, to come together and realize that there actually is a way for everybody to come in and have an ability to be financially incented in the right way to have the right outcome. Uh, almost perfectly on time. We'll end there. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.